going on? A different, a different topic. Another breakthrough that you don't really want is a whole heap of uh, hoons, hoons coming cars. through your uh, your windscreen and to through also through <laughs> your your front door sometimes. But but it's not just that. It's also the noise that they create oh, and sitting at the traffic lights. You hear those motorcycles. I know I shouldn't generalise, but the revving of the engines sometimes in the middle of the night, bins oh. going, everything. You just can't sleep. But what absolutely <laughs> terrifies me is actually the fact that, you know, an unsuspecting person like myself might be just driving through somewhere and be involved in some of the activities, like totally not doing anything wrong myself, That's but right. caught out. And we've heard several examples of that in the last few weeks so where people be. have been caught in accidents. Yeah, absolutely. And they were just basically innocent passers-by. So to talk to us more a little bit about that, we're joined now by the CEO of the Motor Trade Association, Peter Fitzpatrick. Welcome, Peter. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Edwina. How, How are, are you? you? Look Good, very thanks. well. Oh, ah, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So now Terrible old morning out there. Well, right, <laughs> it is. Anyway, it is. You've we got need your to run. Coat on. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. Now, lots of accidents occur because of this. Mm. Some of the ones that you've seen are serious situations. Just tell us more about those. Some young girls that have been involved in accidents. Well, we've seen in, in recent weeks, we've seen the death of, of a teenage girl, which has been widely reported in the media, and, mm -hmm. and that's a tragic event under any circumstances, particularly it's preventable. And, and over east there's been an elderly couple who were killed, who, mm -hmm. were, uh, who were innocently caught up in, uh, in a drag racing uh, event over there, if you want to call it that, or a, a drag racing incident. Uh, and I just think it's time that we put the foot down on this one pretty hard. You know, we saw the Premier come out over the weekend with a, with a lot of money being thrown at graffiti and a tough stance on graffiti, and I haven't got any argument with that. I think that's a good idea. But I think it's time they threw some money at this one and threw some effort at this one because it seems to me that there's too many young people out there uh, putting everybody's lives at risk. And you just can't allow that to continue. It's like letting people go armed in public with a, with a weapon virtually and uh, I think it's time some money and some resources were put into this particular area. Yeah. So Peter, in your experience, what um, could be some of the major driving factors behind people engaging in this sort of behaviour that endangers other people's lives? Every young person at some stage in their life and normally in their teens think they're indestructible and we all did it and I think anyone who thinks that that, that that they didn't, well then they're probably deluding themselves. We all did stupid things when we were young and we somehow have to, to, to work through that uh, and what we've got to try and do is get to young people early, look, give them an opportunity. If they want to do drag racing, well then let's put them out on a drag racing arena or a strip somewhere where they can do it under control with proper officials looking after them mm. rather than on the streets, which is no place to be when you've got other people trying to use the roads at the same time. So there may be avenues for, for, for uh, people letting off steam, young people letting off steam this way. Now if you can't do that, well then you've got to really start stepping in and intervening here. And there's really, I had a bit of a think about this, there's sort of four stages in it. There's education, there's training, there's enforcement and then there's a the sort of rehabilitation. And you, you can't just sort of say, well look, let's just take their cars off them or let's just do this. There's, a whole, there's, there's four real steps you've got to take here to try and fix this problem. Education, at school, we've got to teach kids to respect motor vehicles and respect the road law. And if that means showing them films of, you know, uh, gory Graphic, films yeah. of kids mm -hmm. dying, or if it means them visiting a morgue, as they do in some other countries of the world, to see what the impact of uh, stupid actions are, well then so be it. Well actually one of the articles that, that you sent me prior to this interview, um, one of the coppers in the New South Wales who has the impounded cars, he shows the kids through yes, the, and see to show not the cars that they're impounded from hoon action but that were involved in fatal accidents. Fatal accidents, so that's yes. a kind of education yeah, sort of, that you're but, talking but, about? Yeah, it's a bit of shock action there but, but also mm. just to, to educate kids and parents to a certain extent of the dangers of this. To, to, you've almost got to have a respect for a car like you do for a, for a plane. People don't mess around with planes. You know, you, you make sure that a plane is fit to drive and the people driving it are properly tested. So the, the training, the education's the first bit, training's the next. You've got to train people to drive. We don't mm. do that now. We do a steering test, really. You, mm. right. As long as you can do a three-point turn and you can park and you don't hit anything on the test, you're probably going to get through. It mm. doesn't mean to say you can drive at night. doesn't mean to say you can drive in the rain. doesn't mean to say you can drive at gravel or under emergency conditions. Mm. So it's like flying with a pilot that can't do emergencies. You know, none of mm. us would want to do that. The next stage is enforcement. What do you do with people who don't get the message from education and training? Do you confiscate their cars and keep them until they learn to behave? Maybe that's the way we've got to go. 
And then finally, rehabilitation. What do you do with those kids that just simply don't learn? You've got to put them in a stage where you, you keep training them, you keep working with them, and perhaps they've got to go and do some community work in, a, in, a, in an emergency ward and a few other things mm. to a point where we believe they're safe to let back on the road. Now, if you take that sort of simple four-stage approach, it's not simple in the sense of implementation, but simple in terms of concept, then I think we'd go a long way towards fixing this problem. Now, Peter, you're really focusing on, uh, you say, the young drivers out there. There must be a specific age group, mainly from when you first get your licence, let's say, up to when you become slightly more mature to about the age of 25. Is this right? The right? Seven, 17 to 25 is, is accepted by insurance companies and most road safety experts as being the real danger zone. The, 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 the hot spot, I suppose, really, is that 17, 18, 19, and it depends on the individuals. Look, there's some terrific young kids out there who hop in their cars. Some of them work for me. That they drive to and from work each day. They are very sensible. They look after their cars. They get them serviced and they do all the right things. But there is an element out there, and it may be five, maybe ten percent of young people who want to push the boundaries. Mm. And, uh, and look, that may be part of growing up, but. We can't afford to let them grow up at other people's expense. In other words, mm. put lives at risk at because they're letting off a bit of steam. Yeah. If they want to let off a bit of steam, let's find an avenue for them to do it. But underpinning all of this, there's got to be a much greater community acceptance of the problem. Mm. Parents have got to become a bit more proactive with this, and maybe we have to educate parents. But we've got to train people better and we've got to educate them better right from the outset. Uh, you know, we do have defensive driving courses in this state. We're in a day like today where it's raining outside, you can put a kid behind the wheel and then you can take them out in a controlled environment and show them just how cars perform so much differently. Uh, you can teach them how to drive on gravel. A young person driving an old car with worn shock absorbers on gravel is more likely to have a rollover than anyone else I know. Mm. And yet we don't teach them how to do that. Yeah. We, as long as they can do a three-point turn in a city street, then they're considered to be eligible to drive. So maybe we should look back at to the, dri the initial driving test when the young 17-year-olds are going to get their test. Maybe we should change the structure of that. I think we should. That, that's part of the problem. That's one of the four point sort of package mm -hmm. that I've put to you this morning. Um, yeah, th that certainly should be done. Now, I can tell you I've got a problem here. The road safety authorities don't agree with me on this, and they say if you teach young people to drive defensively or to give them greater skills to handle emergencies, they'll push the, they'll push the envelope a bit, a bit further. Now, look, I don't particularly subscribe to that. You know, I would rather fly with a pilot that might not be the best pilot in the world, but at least trained in emergencies, mm. than one who isn't trained in emergencies in the event that he might sort of uh, do something silly in the air. I'd mm. rather have somebody who's trained to, to, to perform under pressure and to perform under unusual circumstances than someone who's not. And so I can't, I, I really don't fathom that argument. Yeah. And it's a, I have this wonderful debate with people. And whenever I mention this, there'll be someone who'll come up and say, no, no, you can't do that. You'll teach kids how to drive faster and all this sort of stuff. And interestingly, with your pilot analogy, to extend that a bit further, where do the pilots get that training? Not actually in a real life situation. They get some supervised yeah. experience. They yeah. get it in a flight simulator. Yeah, well, you, you yeah. may, see, we may even put money, the government mm. might want to put money into simulators to, mm. you know, to train kids in this. Maybe, maybe that's the way to go, that we, we have two or three simulators and, and part of the driving test is to, is to do a, a simulated yeah. training test and different conditions. To, to, to all the different types of conditions. Now I, I'm not, I haven't sort of you know, come up with a complete funding package or anything else for this but it does need government money committed to it and it does need a bit more commitment from the education department and schools to actually include this sort of stuff in the syllabus. I think you've got to start at the schools and you've certainly got to involve the parents as, as best you can. But this is real life school stuff. You know, it's no mm. good teaching. No, mm. Kids are no good getting A's in maths if they're going to be dead in 12 months mm. on the road. That's right, Peter. So I actually I have a strong belief that if you're going to work with young people, you've got to work at, at, with, at, with their, their... It's not someone like me coming and telling them what to do. Mm. You, you've got to convince them there's a need for them to be better... Uh, educated, better trained in this area. Otherwise, they simply won't be around to enjoy an adult life. Mm. Which is our ultimate goal, is that everybody can live a long, happy, healthy life to their full potential without having mm. these accidents involved yeah. along the way. So Including those innocent people who absolutely. are likely to get caught up in all yeah. of this. And I just think you know, that the, our roads are dangerous enough without being used as drag strips. And uh, we, we probably... 
The other thing we probably need in the enforcement side, which I haven't spent a lot of time on, is we probably need a few police resources and maybe we need a special police squad dealing with kids. Mm. So we might need a police youth traffic squad or whatever yeah. you want to call it that, that, that becomes expert in this area. Well, we've run out of time, Peter, but thank you for coming to talk to us a lot more about this very, very important area and one that's very front of mind for a lot of people at the moment given the accident. So thanks for joining us again this morning. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Peter.